The year was 1993, and I was but a tiny speck. A three-year-old, I was a toddler, but I have some distant memories of that time. My mother was pregnant with my little sister, and on that particular day, the uh, issues of pregnancy involving horrific illness were somewhat debilitating to my mother, and thus she requested that my father take me anywhere but home on that particular day. My father, of course, obliged to spend time with me and to give my mother a bit of a break as she was, you know, pregnant. And thus he took me on our regular activity of train spotting, this time to the Pittsburgh area. We sat out by the tracks across the river from the city and we expected only to see, well, diesels, naturally. It was understandable, it was the 1990s. Everyone had diesels by that point and a few trains did go by, and it was nice. We had stopped at McDonald's prior to, and were sitting in the back of my dad's van with the hatch open, just watching the trains go by. But then we heard a sound that was discernibly not a diesel. It was unusual, though I did recognize it, as I watched many of my dad's VHS documentaries of steam locomotives in the past. Yup, it was a steam engine. On the main line in Pittsburgh? As the engine roared by, my dad snapped some pictures, and it's one of my earliest memories. I don't think it was the first steam engine I ever saw in real life, but it is the first one I clearly remember. The engine thundered past with an immeasurable force, cementing yourself as a core memory in my mind. It's definitely one of the fondest memories I have spending time with my father. But the real question was, which engine had that been? And what was she doing on a main line in Pittsburgh? Well, for a while, I didn't even know. When I was young, I had no idea about, you know, numbers and railways. I just like, train, 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 because I was three. And the internet was not in common use in 1993, so we couldn't really do that much research to figure out exactly which locomotive that had been and why she was there. But we did have the pictures, and on the side of her tender was Chesapeake in Ohio, and her number was 2765. But you might be saying, Darkness, the title of this video says it engine is Nickel Plate Road 765. What's the deal with that? Well, I did the digging and the research to figure all this out, as my coincidental sighting of her in my youth is certainly only a small part of this locomotive story. Hello, hello, I bet you were wondering where this intro was, and welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse, and before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British rail critics, and of course, my underwater train finders. You were the reason why this content remains a childhood memory, and today, we are going to discuss, that's right, Nickel Plate Road number 765, a very specific locomotive that for a time was a bit of a mystery to me. As I would not have called her that, I would have called her Chesapeake and Ohio number 2765. But why the difference in numbers, you ask? Let's find out. This is the story of the preservation of Nickel Plate Road number 765. Nickel Plate Road, number 765, is a Class S2, a 284 Berkshire, that was built for the New York, Chicago, and St. Louis Railroad, that's generally just called the Nickel Plate Road. She and her sisters were Berkshires, a type of locomotive developed by Lima Locomotive Works. And if you've seen my video about Lima, you already know all about this. The Berkshire wheel arrangement was coined as a superpower type steam locomotive in an effort to give them larger fireboxes to meet further demands of longer trains on modern railways. The Berkshires were impressive beasts, new styles of locomotives giving access to this unspeakable power. And many railroads took Lima up on the new designs. The Nickel Plate Road in particular eventually employed 80 Berkshires on their high-speed freight and passenger trains. And the first order, which were just called the S-Class, consisted of 15 locomotives that were actually built not by Lima, but Alco. But they were based on Lima's designs. Eight years later, Lima themselves produced three more subclasses of those Alco-built locomotives which were actually pretty spot on in terms of overall design, but they did differ in weight. Class S1, numbers 715 to 739, were built in 1942, 
The S2s, numbers 740 to 769, were built in 1944, and the S3s, numbers 770 to 779, were built as late as 1949, and they were often referred to as the 700s, due to their numbers. There were also S4s that were acquired later, when the Nickel Plate Road wound up leasing the Wheeling and Lake Erie Railroad in 1949. The railroad actually earned a reputation for high speed service, which later became its motto, due to the performance of the Berkshires. They were really good steam locomotives. But the individual we're talking about is, of course, 765, and her construction was completed on September 8th, 1944. As I said, she was an S2. She was first assigned to Bellevue, Ohio, where she was mostly used on fast freight trains. After World War II, she worked out of a classification yard on the east side of Fort Wayne, Indiana. She was known to be very reliable. In fact, the crews loved her in particular, but her service life didn't last very long due to the advent of dieselization. And 765's final revenue run in her original service life was on June 14, 1958, where she was activated to supply steam heat to a stranded passenger train. Even after she and her sisters were retired, many were still kept in serviceable condition by the railroad, just in case. But it was the late 50s and the 60s. Due to competition from the trucking industry, traffic was going down. And in the early 60s, Nickel Plate Railroad began to put their remaining steam engines outside, and they'd be scrapped by 1964. But number 765, given she was one of the last to be in service, was actually in excellent mechanical condition, and local crews, of course, loved her. So the railroad kept her inside until 1961, and in order to honor the success of Fort Wayne's Elevate the Nickel Plate project, the city actually requested S2 number 767 for display in Lawton Park. 767 was one of 765's sisters, and she was actually the first ceremonial train to open that overpass. Keeping her around as a park engine was a pretty good method for preserving steam locomotives, but the problem was, it turned out, 767 in particular was in horrible condition, deteriorated beyond the point of being appropriate for a donation to a city. In order to compensate for this problem, 765, again, who was in excellent condition, was donated instead. They just renumbered her to 767. Shh! Don't tell anybody, it's a secret. And she was given to the city on May 4th, 1963, for display at 4th and Clinton Streets. Seven sixty five, pretending to be her sister, would sit in that spot for a little over ten years. She wasn't under any kind of cover, and as is the case with many a park engine, this was a problem because she was exposed to the elements, and that's bad. But in September of nineteen seventy one, at an annual convention of the Nickel Plate Historical and Technical Society, a group of men named Wayne York, Glenn Brendel, and Walter Sassmanshawson Jr met to discuss forming a group specifically dedicated to cosmetically restoring 765, as well as Wabash 534, who had been sitting in Swinney Park since 1957. By November of 1972, the group had been joined by a man named John Eichmann, and they signed incorporation papers for the Fort Wayne Railroad Historical Society, sometimes just called FWRHS, which is still a mouthful. There's really no way to abbreviate that in a way that isn't a lot of syllables, but whatever. By 1973, they undertook a 25-year lease of 765, still pretending to be her sister. Shh, don't tell anybody a secret. And in 1974, she was finally moved to New Haven, Indiana, to begin a restoration process that now had been upgraded to putting her back into operation. At first, they were only going to cosmetically restore her, but they decided to go all the way with it and actually bring her back up to steam. From 1975 to 1979, the restoration process was undertaken at the corner of Ryan and Edgerton Roads in New Haven. That site lacked actual shop facilities as well as protection from the elements, but they still managed to pull it off. On September 1st, 1979, she made her first move under her own power, and she was also renumbered back to her, well, actual number. She was no longer pretending to be her sister. She was now 765. In the wintertime, later the same year, she ran under her own power 
to Bellevue in Sandusky, Ohio, in order to be stored inside in a heated barn. In the spring of 1980, she underwent a series of break-in runs and her first public excursion. This act is actually pretty historic, as it made number 765 the first mainline steam locomotive to be restored and operated by an all-volunteer nonprofit. The ripple effect she had on the preservation community as a whole shouldn't be questioned. Not only was the achievement great, FWRHS did a phenomenal job with this, but into the 1980s, Class 1 railroads began to realize that restoring and operating steam locomotives was really good for marketing. It was actually good for the company to invest in this old rolling stock because people liked steam locomotives. They liked seeing them. It was good PR for them. In 1982, the Southern Railway actually leased number 765 from the organization for their own steam program because their own locomotive, Chesapeake in Ohio 2716, was dealing with firebox problems that would take too long to fix. 765 pulled these trips flawlessly, and that paved the way for the continuation of the steam program into Southern Railway's merger with Norfolk and Western. When both companies became one and became Norfolk Southern, the steam program went on for a number of years, and it wound up involving locomotives like 484, Norfolk and Western, number 611. 765 is also a little bit of a movie star, actually. She appeared in two movies in the 1980s, Four Friends and Matawan. And she also became an annual attraction in the New River Gorge, operating the New River trains from 1985 to 1988, and then again from 1990 to 1993. Those trips were actually very big, regularly seeing 765 pulling over 30 car passenger trains, traveling 300 miles, 480 kilometers, in a round trip during peak fall color season with passengers that came from around the world to experience it. It was astonishingly successful. In 1985, FWRHS actually obtained full ownership of 765. They no longer just had her on lease, they had her for real. In August of 1991, 765 was paired with a recently restored steam locomotive, Pair Marquette- Oh my gosh, it's Christmas! It's 1225 for the National Railroad Historical Society convention that was going on that year in Huntington, West Virginia. In July of 1993, 765 and a fellow nickel plate railroad, number 587, performed a double header. Right after that happened, she was actually re-lettered and renumbered to Chesapeake in Ohio, number 2765, in recognition of the heritage of the route on which the New River trains traveled. This is where the confusion started for myself and my father. When we saw 765, she was back in disguise again. She was masquerading as CNO number 2765. The real 2765 was a 284 and built by Lima, but outwardly they looked a bit different than the Nickel Plates Berkshires. CNO also didn't call their Berkshires Berkshires. They called theirs Kanawas, but they were still 284s either way. So, yeah. When we saw her, she was in disguise, which is why she threw us off, but I still remember her very well, as one of the fondest memories I have from when I was young. And I just want to stress the astonishing coincidence of this happening to us. Do you understand how unlikely it was that we went there on the day she was running past, and during the time when she was operating incognito? She did not look like that for very long, less than a year, in fact, based on sources. My dad and I absolutely did not know that there was a steam locomotive operating near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania at the time. We just went down there because my mom was sick. That was it. One of those things, but I guess stranger things have happened. It's just, yeah. Anyway, 765 in general, though, was one of the most prolific excursion locomotives operating across Class 1 railroads. She ran on lines owned by Conrail, CSX, and Norfolk Southern. She had pulled the New River Train a record of 32 times by 1993 and headlined 124 trips over Norfolk Southern by 1994. Trains Magazine awarded her the title of Veteran Excursion Engine in 1992. And Railfan and Railroad Magazine in 1994 referred to her as the reason why boys still leave home. By 1993, she had accumulated 115,000 miles, 185,000 kilometers, since her last major overhaul that was conducted by Nickel Plate. 52,000 of those miles, 84,000 kilometers, 
were all incurred during her excursion career. But naturally, with use comes wear and tear. And though FWRHS had babied her quite a bit and done the best they could to keep her well maintained, there were some things they just couldn't prevent, especially with her being used so much. By the end of the last tours in 93, she was pulled entirely from excursion service and was largely kept on static display between the end of that year and 2001. It took that long to get her up and going. FWRHS still kept busy with excursions, however. They operated Milwaukee Road 261, a northern type, and they were largely responsible for restoring Chesapeake and Ohio 2716, the one that 765 had replaced, remember, for the southern steam excursions. That was done under lease from the Kentucky Railway Museum. But after her initial operations in 1996, she required new tubes and flues, per the newly enacted Federal Railroad Administration regulations for steam locomotives specifically. Due to the complicated nature of operating multiple locomotives, the Society decided it was best to fully invest all their resources into a complete rebuild of 765. They actually managed to get some grants through the Transportation Equity Act for the 21st century, which was a federal transportation bill. At the time, it included historic structures. Now, I would argue that a steam locomotive isn't exactly a structure, but as far as the government was concerned at the time, they totally were, and were giving the society free money to fix the locomotive. They actually got 80% of the funds through that grant, and the remaining 20% was raised through donations and contributions. A large portion of the rebuild work was administered by volunteers. Over a period of five years, 765 was completely disassembled, with its boiler, frame, and running gear separated, and major components of those remachined or rebuilt entirely. This was a very, very in-depth project. In July 2005, she underwent a successful steam test and was rolled out the following October for the general public to see. The commissioners of the society designated October 28th, 2005 as engine number 765 day, and she completed a series of test runs on the Chicago, Fort Wayne, and Eastern Railroad in March 2006. The rebuild process had taken 15,000 hours, at least, probably more, and cost over $772,000, but the end result was a completely revitalized 765. In 2006, the Society was given a Locomotive Restoration Award by the Tourist Railway Association, Incorporated, as well as an Outstanding Restoration Award from the Architecture and Community Heritage Foundation of Fort Wayne, due to their work on 765. But getting her back into excursion service proved to be a lot more difficult than they would have liked. See, they were initially unable to secure a host railroad that was willing to operate her, not because of anything wrong with her specifically, but because when it came to steam locomotives in the modern day, there are mounting liability costs in terms of insurance and things like that, which they need to legally be allowed to put them on the rails. And at that time, modern railroads were actually looking up in terms of having very busy schedules with a lot of trains. So it was difficult to find the space as well as convince a railroad to sink the cost into allowing a steam locomotive excursion. Despite the difficulty getting her back on a class one railroad, the Hoosier Valley Railroad Museum was a lot more receptive to the idea. And 765 ran her first official trips in 16 years on May 21st, 2009. It was found that she was much more welcomed on regional and short line railroads who loved to have the opportunity to have a large steam locomotive on their lines. And from 2009 to 2011, she operated on Chesapeake and Indiana, Great Lakes Central, Iowa Interstate, etc. In fact, her trip on the Iowa Interstate allowed her to traverse the Mississippi River for the first time ever. In 2012, Norfolk Southern finally got a bit more receptive to having a steam locomotive around, and they lease number 765 to operate a series of employee appreciation specials in Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Missouri to mark the company's 30th anniversary. In fact, the FWRHS was celebrating their own 40th anniversary, and the thing about them, and this is what I love 
actually, is they were very, very good at embracing new technologies when it came to advertising and integrating rail fans around their locomotives. What they did was is that they outfitted 765 with a GPS tracker, which was viewed over 120,000 times on August 20th, 2012. There was also a mobile app version that was downloaded over 19,000 times. 765 is also the first steam locomotive to maintain an active Twitter presence? Yeah, really, go figure. Which was a practice that was later followed by Union Pacific's steam program. In 2013, 765 was officially included in Norfolk Southern's 21st Century Steam Program, which was an effort to engage with the general public and celebrate the railroad's heritage through steam locomotive operation. It was for PR and marketing, but hey, more power to them, I'm fine with that. She operated public trips in Ohio and Pennsylvania in May of 2013, in fact, Memorial Day weekend wound up marking the first public steam-powered excursions over Horseshoe Curve since 1977. In August of 2013, the Society announced plans to run two 225-mile, 362-kilometer, round-trip excursions in mid-October 2013 between Fort Wayne and Lafayette, Indiana, along a line that was once owned by the Wabash Railroad. That was the first time since 1993 that a steam excursion had operated out of Fort Wayne at all. In 2015, her schedule was just ridiculous. No, seriously, there were so many excursions in so many different states. She was in Ohio, she was in New York, she was in Pennsylvania, she was in Indiana, she was all over the place, but she was doing work. And when she was in Scranton, PA, which is where the Steamtown National Historic Site is, she was housed in one of their roundhouses for Railfest 2015, alongside Nickel Plate Road 759. Yeah, I should probably be clear on that. 765 isn't actually one of a kind. One of her sisters, 759, is still alive, and they were reunited in 2015. And they're not alone either. Based on my research, there are currently a total of seven Class S2s still in preservation. However, all of them are kept on static display, except for 765. Speaking of her, between 2016 and 2018, the Society teamed up with Metra, which is Chicago's commuter rail system, to pull excursions with 765. And she did. However, in 2020, 765 wasn't able to pull any excursions. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, such activities were largely, well, banned entirely in some states. It depends where you were, but the point is, there were no steam excursions going on. And she was only steamed up once on the weekend of October 2nd to the 4th, 2020, just to make sure she didn't need any repairs or anything like that. In September of 2021, she did return to her excursion service, and she wound up meeting up with another one of her sisters, number 757, who had recently received a cosmetic restoration by the Mad River and NKP Railroad Museum. From July to October of 2022, 765 visited the Indiana Northeastern Railroad to haul the Indiana Rail Experience excursions as part of a multi-year partnership between them and the FWRHS. Given the arrangement, she'll probably be out there for quite a bit of time. And on average, she experiences 3,000 visitors a day when she's operating, with visitor and passenger numbers running between 40,000 and 60,000 ticket buyers between 2009 and 2011, in less than 30 days, respectively. A typical train she would pull can carry anywhere between 600 to 1,000 people. And consistent media reports mention that whenever 765 is around, there's always large crowds of locals and out-of-towners to watch her go by. Her ability to boost tourism in the towns that she goes through is one of the highlights of her excursion career. In 2012, the Pittsburgh Tribute's headline photo proclaimed that 765 was the engine that still can, and in 2013 called her a crowd favorite. CBS Pittsburgh described her as 400 tons of Americana. When she's not operating excursions, she's maintained in a restoration shop in New Haven by a crew of 70 to 100 volunteers throughout the year. The shop is open to the public, actually, and houses a variety of other railroad equipment. And as for the operational expenses, well, it's often underwritten by the paid memberships to the society, as well as donations, and of course the ticket sales. On top of that, 765 is supposed to be 
possibly the centerpiece of a proposed riverfront development project to be called Headwaters Junction in the locomotive's hometown of Fort Wayne. The plan is endorsed as big, bold, and transformational by city leaders and civic groups, and isn't it always, but it calls for the locomotive, as well as FWRHS operations, to be based in a mixed-use attraction by combining railroad tourism, river access, walking trails, as well as retail, restaurant, residential, recreational, and entertainment businesses. It's still in the early stages of planning, but it would be pretty interesting to see. It sounds kind of neat, a good development project for a city either way. And at the end of the day, 765 is kind of a quiet star when it comes to steam locomotives. She's not 611, and she's not 844. She's certainly not 4014, and she's not Merry Christmas! But she's just herself. She's 765, a Berkshire. One of the best kinds of locomotives that Lima Locomotive Works ever made, and she's had a heck of a career as an excursion locomotive, and has arguably had much more of an impact during the latter part of her life than she did when she was in actual service. Not that the Nickel Plate Road didn't use her, she was well loved by them too, but the point is, when I finally figured out which steam locomotive I saw that day, I was pretty happy to know it was her. I haven't actually seen her in person since that day either. But someday, I hope we'll meet again. And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders. Some dude 267, Orange Glass, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitson, 131-232, Josh Johnson, Metal for Life Guy, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, Tommy Rossini, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Joshua Long, Brian, Jack Carson's Rare Videos, Hayden DeGrow, Master of None, Dr. Racer 78, Lord Hawk 444, Alaric Jaspers, The Baxter, That Guy with a Beard, Mark Holding, Lock Kraken, Crystal Morgan, A Person 723, DM Trouble Typhoon, Ohio Trucker 1, Hendrick Motorsports Fan 5, Alfonso Lapuche, Royal Hudson 2860, and Ice Surfer 1405. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell.